Well, grace and peace to all of you on this Lord's Day. I am so thrilled that you are all here. I am Pete Burns, and I am the sheepdog to the Great Shepherd here at Church of the Palms. And I can look at you and see some of you are very satisfied in our challenges for to keep you awake because you've had pancakes. <laughs> and others of you are very eager because you have not yet had your pancakes, but you're going to go down after this service and help the scouts out who are doing a fundraiser with pancakes. They have regular pancakes, they have blueberry pancakes, they have gluten-free pancakes, they have pancakes with chocolate chips. And I just heard that Larry Kittner is going to introduce us to pancakes with peanut butter and syrup on top. Anybody done that before? Really? Just a great, I've never heard of that. And Larry reminded us that's what's the beauty of Church of the Palms. We come from all different places. So i got to have one more pancake. <laughs> and so do you. Even if you don't eat pancakes, you know that we are blessed with Troop 213 here at Church of the Palms, and a troop that has exploded because, as you might know, Cub Scouts get to pick the troop that they join. And Troop 213, that makes its home at Church of the Palms, is known as a, a wonderful troop with a lot of activity and camping. And so we got a lot of scouts there at 44 scouts. They just went to scout camp. And so they are blessed. We are blessed to have them here. This is their fundraiser to cover all of that. I know you people, you're generous. So please do what you can and enjoy the pancakes. And we're going to vote on the peanut butter afterwards, okay? <laughs> It's also been a wild and crazy week here. If you don't know what happened here, we had VBS, and nobody does VBS like Church of the Palms. It's hard to like put it all because we've been working for several months and doing stuff. It's hard to like capture it all, like what happened. So we tried to do it, but what we did is we sent out one of our film crews to follow around Portia, the director of Children, Youth, and Family Ministry, and the director of our VBS, and we tried to follow her around as she gave us a glimpse for just one day of VBS to give us the clue as to how it went and here's what we got when they came back each evening the children would come in get checked in for vbs but even before we arrived the brothers were hard at work in the kitchen getting everything ready and each evening we got together to talk about what we would, could expect for the day and then of course it was time to pray then we would leave together as a group sit down to eat a wonderful meal prepared by the brothers and after dinner, we all got together in our individual families, or what we call oikos, to talk about the scripture of the day, and then we would begin our journey. Well, we're here, this is, we're at the start of our journey, and we're getting ready to go in and to see Paul and Dionysus, where they are set in uh, uh, Paul's tent-making abode. So let's go. I want everybody to know about Jesus, and I want to tell everybody about Jesus. You have visited here, but in case you've forgotten, I am a member of the council. Well, here they are. They're getting ready to go to their next, their next place, their next rotation. Are you having fun? Yeah! I'm going to say that's a yes on fun, right? Right? What's your favorite part? Music. Music. Yeah. Crafts. What else? Crafts. Crafts. You like the crafts, too. Good. Yeah. You like the games? Well, see, I guess we're having fun here at Vacation Bible School. So now we're getting ready to go into our VBS Marketplace. Let's see what they're up to today. Ooh, look at this. Look at everything they've been doing here. The pods. Look at the bling. Ooh, this looks like fun. What are you guys up to in here? They're making scrolls. They're making scrolls. Is that... Greek letters. Very cool. Very annoying. It's, it's, it's a very it's challenging. challenging. I like the way you yeah. spin that. They're working really hard. Thank you. Bye. Well, we're here in our one of my favorite times, and we are in celebration where they're learning all their uh, dance moves and the new uh, songs for the week that we're doing. So we've got Miss Tonya leading the kids. Look at Mark Reed. He's quite a dancer. I love it. 
And now we're getting ready to go into our mission project, which this year is all about water and the shortage of water and how we can take dirty water and make it into clean. Travel. And get in there. When I can't feel it. <laughs> I got it a little full. Good job. Okay. We're gonna go down. <laughs> now what we're gonna do, okay, is we're gonna let this drip tonight. So you can see it. And overnight then we're gonna pour it back through again. And you'll see it really looks clear tomorrow when you come. Hi guys. Wow, look at you guys are busy tonight. What are you up to? Making rainbows, I love it. We're not making rainbows. Oh, maybe we, we're not all on the same consensus here. But we're, are you having fun? Yeah! Who knew? Well, here we are for one of my other favorite parts, and this is games, and it's so much fun this year. We finally got a beautiful day, so we're outside tonight, and um, they're, uh, they're doing games that were similar to ancient Athens. Uh, yesterday was so much fun. They did javelin shooting, and um, just they've done relay races and all kinds of stuff that are close to the Olympic Games of Athens, ancient Athens. Well, here we are. We just finished our rotation where we went through missions and crafts, and, and um, music and dance, and now here we are at celebration. So come on, take a look. Well, it's the end of Vacation Bible School at Church of the Palms, and um, it was amazing, but it is exhausting. But we're really excited for next year. We're excited that this was such a wonderful year. And that's a wrap. Such a great week. We had somebody uh, mention after the first service, aren't you doing this for two weeks? We'll consider that for next year, but it was a great time. Just a word about our service today. Today we are blessed to have Portia be our proclaimer. Most of you know Portia is our Director of Children and Youth and Family Ministries, which some of you don't know is she's also a candidate for licensed and ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church. In the Methodist Church, all the pastors come from the local church. You can't get a pastor that doesn't come out of the local church. And you, as Church of the Palms, you have a unique DNA. In your short history of only 19 years, you have sent and journeyed along with four people into a licensed ordained ministry. It started with Russell Friedman, your founder. It went with Janice Maybe as you sent her into licensed ministry. You're walking along with me as I walk towards ordination, and I will get ordained someday. <laughs> And, um, and now you're walking along with Portia as she's entering licensed and ordained ministry. Some of you know that she has a, a significant uh, appearance at the end of, the, of August before the District Board of Ordained Ministry, where we anticipate that she will be formally certified, which is a, a key moment in the whole process as uh, she goes forward, and that opens up some opportunities and responsibilities that go along with that. Many of you have asked, well, this is what you choose, and, and we are very quick to say, you don't choose this. This chooses you. This is why we call it a calling. Many times you find yourself in the middle of this process with all of the boards, all of the requirements, all of the steps, and you go, why am I doing this? Well, it's not because we choose it, because we're called to do it. And it takes people uh, to support you along the way. So people have asked me, how can we support Portia as she goes through this? Let me give you three quick ways. The first way is to encourage her. Because it's often many times when you have one more paper to do or another board that doesn't seem to understand what it means to be in the real church doing real work. You need encouragement to keep on taking one more step because it's difficult and there's so many ways you could just stop. So encourage her. The second thing, and I'm going to just name the elephant in the room, there's finances involved. The church does help, but as you know, Portia's already enrolled in Fuller Seminary, taking classes online, and I don't know if you've looked at what it costs to go and get a graduate degree or even what the cost of books are. 
You all help already in church finances, but there's more costs that need to be covered. And if you feel moved to do that, you can make a donation to Portia's Continuing Education Fund so that that can continue. And I know that what we covered as much as all of that are your prayers to help Portia feel God's calling upon her life, to discern what that means. She is at the start of a process that many of you have experienced because you have walked along with other people before. It's very long and very tedious, and it's a, a task that you do because you have this calling. Today you're going to be blessed because you already have decided as a, a church that you see in her the gifts and graces that you attribute to a pastor in the United Methodist Church. You've already stated that. You get to confirm that again today. And I just pray that others get to see that as well. So this is a great day. And you are blessed and you will be a blessing because you are here. Because God is thrilled that you came. God is excited that you're here. And with that, would you please stand and welcome each other in the name of Christ this day. The Lord be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the call to worship. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses and heroes of our faith, and let us run with perseverance that the race that is set before us. Let us pray. God of grace, we open our hearts and our minds and souls as we come to worship you and you alone. We thank you that today we come and be, are able to dwell in your kingdom and live in your presence. We thank you that as we gather together, you join us with common purposes in our busyness, with testimonies to share, and with the opportunity to build your kingdom here and around the world. Allow all that we have and all that we've been given to be used to glorify your holy name. Let us come together, inspire us, and lead us in our time together. We ask this all in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.
You may be seated. Good morning. This morning, I will be reading from 1 Timothy, the first chapter, verses 12 through 14, from the Common English Bible. Within this short passage, the Apostle Paul shares his experience of having encountered Jesus Christ and of being transformed by his love and grace. Okay, First Timothy chapter, first chapter, verses 12 through 14. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, because he considered me faithful. So he appointed me to ministry, even though I used to speak against him, attack his people, and was proud. But I was shown mercy because I acted ignorance without faith. Our Lord Savior poured all over me along with the faithfulness and the love that are in in Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. I take that back. It's not a good morning. It's an awesome morning. It's a miraculous morning. And I'm going to tell you why, because... We did it. We survived VBS, and I have the t-shirt to prove it. (laughs) Woo, we did it. Oh, my gosh. I just want to take a moment and thank you, each and every one of you, for your prayers and for your efforts. You made it amazing. You made it amazing, church. And it was a family, a group effort, and it was amazing. And I am so honored to be able to serve with you. So thank you for that privilege. It was an amazing week that we had. Um, I had, as you saw, the privilege of being able to kind of go all throughout the different areas that they um, experienced. So it was really fun. Um, I was so pleasantly surprised, though, at how much it seemed as if the children enjoyed their time with the Apostle Paul, of course, played by Gary, and his trusty sidekick, Dionysus, with as Larry. They just, they loved the banter, as we all do, um, but I also could see that they were really learning stuff you know they were leaning in they were asking questions about this Paul and and that was really um it was neat to see that you know and and I can relate to it because I also like learning about this apostle Paul don't you all I mean we're doing it sometimes in our bible studies I know the sisters were in Romans right now and and the brothers obviously have done due diligence with their study of Paul but it's very interesting. I mean, he's such a complex character. I mean, just incredible. I mean, the faith that he had. 
But I have to admit the other side of that is that when I study Paul, I can't help but to feel almost intimidated. Do you know what I mean? I mean, he's so, he's so complex and so dynamic in the faith that he had, the trust that he had, and the joy that he had, even under the circumstances that he went through. I mean, he went through shipwrecks and snake bites and persecution and prosecution, and yet even the scriptures tell us that he was singing in prison. And so when I look at my, my own faith journey and then I look at Paul's, I'm like, wah, wah. You know what I mean? I'm like, I don't know. I'm pretty enthusiastic, but not sure if I would be able to rise to that level of enthusiasm and joy and encouragement that he gave to others. So it's important for me, and I don't know, maybe it will be for you too, to to remember that this Apostle Paul that we heard Craig read from, that he was once a man named Saul. And so with that, would you pray with and for me? Oh, merciful God, you know it is my desire to be a vessel, to be an instrument in kingdom building. And so I pray that this morning that you would speak through me. But if that's not possible, it's okay. I just pray that you would communicate to my brothers and sisters in spite of me. Amen. So this Apostle Paul, man, he's got some big shoes to fill, you know. So again, it's important for me to remember that he had a past, you know, because I have a past. And I have a past kind of like Saul in the sense that I'm not too proud of all the things in my past. Um, Before, uh, well, when I was younger, I was known to be pretty impetuous, a little bit of a rebel. I've always been a church lady. You know, I, like I, you know, I pushed the boundaries a couple times. My mom's here to attest to that. So yeah, I was kind of known as a little bit of a rebel. I was predictably unpredictable. You know people like that? That was me. My friends who knew me then and know me now, when we, when we talk about those old days, those war stories, we always say, oh, that was Portia B.C., I was Portia before Christ, and it was a totally different Portia than the one today. So this person, um, anyway, one of my friends, it was funny, we were reflecting on our, our youth and uh, some of those days, and she was telling, she reminded me of a, an instance that we went through, and um, I was always known for my hair, okay? Um, before I moved to the South, it was pretty good, but then I came here in the humidity, it, it was awful, so I used to have good hair, now I just have crazy hair. But, um, yeah, I was kind of, that was kind of my thing, you know. Um, my mom used to say, oh, it's your crowning jewel. And my dad was like, you're never cutting your hair. And so it was this thing. To me, it was just annoying, you know, because uh, every woman hates what God gave them as far as their hair. I mean, that's just who we are. And so I hate it. It was annoying. And so, um, but and anyway, it was the eve of when we were going to get our class pictures taken. Um, we were, uh, you know, for our, the yearbook that goes in there that lives forever. So anyway, my girlfriend and I, we had this great idea, okay, that we wanted to really change our looks up. We wanted to do something different. We wouldn't go the next year looking the same old way because I've literally looked like this my entire life. So we were like, okay, we got this great idea. So we decided that um, we would sneak out. We spent the night. We would sneak out of our house, and we would go do our own cosmetology Just FYI, don't do it. If you're not trained in cosmetology, do not think that you can do that on your own. But nevertheless, we attempted it anyway. And, well, the next day we get ready to um, go to our picture-making thing. You know, we get an I arrive looking like this. (laughs) Good it's a good look, isn't it? It's good look. Well, see, I have really naturally crazy curly hair. I know, I know you think I do this on purpose. I do not. Um, and so I had to use, literally, she put Knox gelatin in my hair to get it to stand like that. So yeah, it was a good look, really good look. Um, and, you know, I decided that, that that wasn't a shock enough. And so while all my girlfriends and stuff, we were getting, like, they were getting their pretty dresses to wear and their pretty blouses, you know, for that time, I decided to finish off the whole look with that T-shirt. And you're very lucky because what's on that T-shirt, you can't see it, but what it's supposed to look like is throw up. 
wait for it, it gets better. Because at the bottom of my t-shirt, it says, party till you puke. <laughs> yeah, I know, it was great, right? I made my mom so proud that day. <laughs> she was so happy with me. So, so see, I get having a past. A past that you're maybe not so proud of. So I know that we can learn a lot from this Apostle Paul, we do, but I think we can learn from Saul. So we are going to pick up, I know we read the scripture, but we're going to do a little back, we're going to go backwards a little bit, and we're going to talk about this guy named Saul, and we're introduced to Saul in the book of Acts, okay? So um, just a little history, just to catch you up, we're going to be... um, We're going to catch Saul at the tail end of the disciple Stephen's sermon, okay? Now, this disciple Stephen, he was so full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he wanted to tell everybody he knew, like Gary, about this Jesus. He wanted everybody to know about this Messiah, this the Son of God that he had come and it happened, and he was so excited. Well, not everybody was so excited about this message. There were some people, actually, who were offended by it. And so they went to the Sanhedrin, you know, that governing body of that time, and and told them they lied about this Stephen, and they said that he was being blasphemous and that he was talking bad about Moses. Big no-no. That is not something you want to do within this culture at all. So the Sanhedrin, they seize him, and they bring him forward. They want to know. They want him to answer to these allegations, right? So Stephen, never missing an opportunity to talk about Jesus, he does that. He decides he's going he's to preach a sermon right there in front of those Sanhedrin. So we are going to catch him at the tail end of this sermon. It's in Acts. It's in the, um, the seventh chapter right at the very end. Let me get to it. Okay, so right at the very end of the sermon. And so I'm just going to read a little bit of it so you can get the tone of this message. Okay, so it starts out, he says, You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. Speaking of Jesus, you have received the law that was given through the angels, but have not obeyed it. Ooh, that's not something you want to be saying to these Sanhedrin people. They were the law. They knew all about the law. And for him to to imply, well, he wasn't really implying. He was pretty much calling them out on it. He was telling them what it was. Now, see, these people were not happy with this, as you can imagine, right? And when I say unhappy, I don't mean like I'm going to send the email a pastor on Monday morning and tell them that that message stunk. No, no, no. They were furious. The scripture goes on to say that at this, they covered their ears and they were yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged Stephen out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul approved of their killing him. It says that on that day of a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Whoa. Okay, so we learn a lot about Saul already, just a couple of verses that we hear about him. But what we already know about Saul, though, is that Saul was unique in the sense that he had dual citizenship. He was both a Roman from his dad's side, and he was a Jew from his mom's side. And not just any Jew. She was from the tribe of Benjamin. That is good Jew DNA right there, okay? That's some good stuff. So, so we know that. Also, what we probably can infer is that they, he was born into a wealthy family, you know, an affluent family for certain. And we know that because we know that Saul was well-educated, okay? Probably because his dad was Roman. He was probably very well-versed in the philosophers of that day because that was very important to them. And then we know because his mom was a good Jew, she's going to raise herself a good Jew boy, so he is definitely going to be, you know, studying under the religious elite of that time. We know that when he was 14, he was sent to Jerusalem so that he could study under Galileo. So we understand, right, that this guy, he's, he's well-educated young man, probably affluent. And we also get that he probably has some power, right? Did you pick it up in that, that verse where it says that... Um, where he goes, you know, that they would lay their coats at the feet of the young man named Saul. So he obviously wasn't just some passerby, and then all of a sudden he's got some coats. He had power. He had presence. 
And we also know that he, when he says that Saul approved of their killing him, that he had authority over these people. So that, that's, you know, we, we can really establish who this Saul is just from these short verses. The other thing that we can establish from here is that not, he wasn't one of these people that just would lay down a law or just say, you know, go ahead, kill him. And then he's going to go back to his paperwork, right? This guy was busy. He was getting after it. It says that he went from house to house, did you hear it? And would pull men and women from their homes, from the church. He was destroying the church. That's us. That's what he was doing. He was getting busy. See, I think, again, we can learn a lot from Paul, but we can learn from Saul because I don't know about you, but I'm busy. I'm a busy person. You know, I'm a mom. I work for a church. You guys, all of you. <laughs> I'm in school. I'm busy. And I get wrapped up in my busyness. I don't know about you, but I'm literally one of these people that I love to make lists. Anybody in here like to make lists? I love lists. They're so cool. In fact, I'm so weird that I will do something and it won't be on my list. I'll put it on my list just so I can mark it off. <laughs> Is there anybody else that does that? Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> I am totally like that. I get so caught up in my busyness sometimes that I'll be doing stuff and checking stuff off and making it all happen. And then I'll be like, why am I doing this? Anybody else do that? I'm going and making it happen and I don't know why. See, sometimes I think I mistake my busyness for purpose. I've been in children's ministry now for over a decade and I've done more vacation Bible schools. I can't even remember. Tonya and I were talking about it. I can't even remember how many I've done. What made this year so different for me is that we were intentional about remembering by reminding one another always what our purpose was. See, our purpose this week was not to teach children about Jesus. It wasn't. It wasn't about teaching them about Paul. And as much as it wasn't about making bling on, on pots or rainbows, or not rainbows, I mean, you know... It wasn't about any of that. What we were doing here, what our purpose this week was, was to establish relationships with these children and their families. It was to stir up within them a feeling so that when they pass this church going down this road or when they come to the pumpkin patch in the fall or when we see one another in the supermarket, they see their, their oikos leader, that they remember that they were loved deeply loved and that they loved back that was our purpose our purpose was to try to stir up within them that feeling that we already know that 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 truth that we get that a life connected to god is it's incredible but it's that life connected to god and to you to you and me that's where our joy, our purpose, and our meaning comes in. And that was our purpose this week. I have done so many vacation Bible schools in the past where we get so busy, you know, um, erecting scenes and painting and, and buying crafts and buying groceries and make, doing all that stuff that I have literally seen Oikos leaders or tribe leaders get frustrated because they couldn't get the lesson done. See, that's what we do when we mistake our purpose for our busyness. I think that we also, you know, we hear in this scripture, we, as it goes on, that this, this Saul, he continues on this busyness, right? He ends up going to, uh, to Jerusalem and he goes to the temple courts because he wants to get some more uh, policemen to go with him to Damascus. And he has to get more paperwork. Imagine even then, you've got to have a bunch of paperwork to get anything done. So anyway, he gets all this paperwork and he's on his way to Damascus and that's when the story gets good, right? We all know this story. This is the best part, right? So he's, he's going down the road and all of a sudden this light appears from out of nowhere and then he's thrown to the ground and then Jesus is audible and Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? We love this story, don't we? I know, it's just the best. It's the best story. But every time I read the story, one question comes to mind. Okay, maybe two. I always wonder if it was he on a horse. I don't know. Anyway, squirrel. Okay, but one story comes to mind for me. One question, 
Why Saul? Why would God choose Saul? Of all the people in this book, why him? He could have chosen one of the 72 that we spoke of a couple weeks ago. He could have chosen one of the 11. But he chose Saul, a murderer, a persecutor, a hater. I love to ask myself this question because it brings me some peace almost. Because that's the question I ask myself a lot of times. Why would God choose me to be a witness? Clearly somebody who's broken. Clearly somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. Clearly somebody who makes bad decisions. (laughs) Why would God choose me? Why would he choose you? Do you ever ask yourself that? See, I think that God knows exactly what he's doing when he chooses the least likely, like Saul, like me, and maybe some of you. Because we have a story to tell. We have a testimony. We've been through things. We know things. You know, God called me into youth ministry during a season in my life, and I truly believe that it was because I understand what it's like to be a broken person. I know what it's like to come from a broken home. I know what it's like to have a father walk out and abandon you for decades with not even one remote reason. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to seriously contemplate taking my own life because the world is a miserable place and I don't belong in it. I get that. And I'm sad to say this today to you all, but there are more youth like me than not. But I have an an ability given by God through my testimony to be able to pull this out of youth, to be able to relate to them on a deeper level than anybody else could. And I have that because I've been there. I'm able to draw out their story, and then I'm, able, I'm given the privilege, the honor of being able to tell these youth, but wait, look what can happen. Look what can happen when you allow Jesus Christ to come into your heart and transform you, to recognize that you are beloved, adored, and precious in his sight. That's what we get to do through our testimony. Think about all the places that Saul could go that nobody else could based on his upbringing and who he was and what he was. It's the same for you and for me. We've been given a gift of our past in order to use it for our future and for somebody else. The other thing I get from this this story of this, this conversion story is that, you know, uh, they didn't uh, just, uh, uh, God didn't just convert Paul and say, leave him on the side of the road and say, enjoy it. He had him get busy with a different purpose. He sent him out to do great things. God knew and wanted him to do great things. That's why he authored. That's why he wrote much of the New Testament. God had a plan. He needed him to do this, to get up, not to bask in his conversion, but move with a new purpose the new destiny. Instead of taking churches down and destroying them, he was to build them up. Instead of persecuting people, he's supposed to be encouraging them. See, that's what God has intended for each of us, to take that testimony that we have that's near and dear to us and to share it with the world, to be active participants in kingdom building, encouraging one another. You know, another thing I learned from this Saul is that, you know, we, we, don't, we can't choose the legacy that we receive. Just like Saul, he couldn't choose to be born to these people. We can assume that they were probably elitists. We know that that, that culture, would have been, there would have been a lot of exclusion going on there. You know what I mean. You know, these Romans are not going to affiliate with these um, foreigners. 
We know pious Jews wouldn't have had anything to do really with the Gentiles who were unclean. And so, I don't know, maybe some of us were raised in that way. Maybe we were brought up in a, in a place where our families um, didn't encourage us to be accepting. In fact, quite the opposite. We were encouraged to exclude people. I don't want you hanging out with those kinds of people, right? I don't want you, I don't want you mingling with that crowd, I don't know, maybe, maybe we had groups that were like, I don't want you to be around those people because they look different. Or maybe because they act different, worship different, dare I say it, love different. I don't know. I get that from here that we cannot choose the legacy that we receive. But friends, we can choose the legacy that we leave. There was a man who was born in the early 1830s, and he was um, uh, born into a, an affluent family, a very well-educated family. Um, this family obviously raised him up very similar to his up, their upbringing, and he was very well-educated. He, he studied all over the world at, in various universities, and he ended up following in his father's footsteps. His father was a physicist and a chemist, very accomplished man. His mother was a teacher. And so he fell, fell in those footsteps of his dad and went way further than his father ever did. He was an incredible inventor, patented many things. And one thing brought him huge success was he would take dynamite, I mean uh, uh, TNT and wrap it in a ballast, and then that was what became dynamite. He invented this dynamite solution, and, and so um, it made him a fortune. I mean, it just it was, it took off. It made him. I guess that's kind of a pun. Anyway, it was, it was a huge explosion. It was awesome. You know, he, he made a ton of money on it, and he was wildly successful with this invention and this patent. And um, so, it, nevertheless, the story goes that one day he's, he's reading the paper, and, and he gets to the obituary section. I guess people like to read that stuff. I don't know. Anyway, so he's reading through it, and he looks down, and all of a sudden he recognizes his own name there. And he's kind of surprised by that, as any of us would be. But, you know, he's in his late 60s. His brother had passed away recently. So I thought, well, maybe they got the names wrong or something like that. And so he's looking at it. And, and then he starts to read it. And he notices he's reading his own story. Starts talking about, like, who he was, you know, who his parents were, you know, who he was leaving behind, what he had done in his career, how successful he was, and all this stuff. And then it says... And he created this, this substance called dynamite, made him ridiculously wealthy, but it also was to the peril of millions of people because they had died as a result of it. And it finally said, the last uh, sentence in the obituary said, but finally, the merchant of death is dead. Pretty awful story. So he was furious, absolutely furious. He contacted his attorney. He's like, we're suing this, 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 this uh, newspaper. Uh, I want to sue him for liable, slander, defamation of character, whatever. Just the th th Then he realized that they were right. He had become the merchant of death. He made a decision at that moment that he wanted to change his legacy he didn't want people to remember him that way. So he, t he decided he was going to take all of his wealth that he had made and he would make, and he was going to put it into a trust fund. And in hopes that after he passed away, that every year somebody would be awarded a prize. A prize awarded to them because they had brought some initiative forward, had designed something that would bring peace upon our planet Of course, we know this man now is um, the Nobel Peace Prize, memory of... Alfred Nobel and each year three people receive a prize based on this man's generosity it's, it was said that at, um, when he passed away he had over 250 million dollars accumulated and this is in the early 1900s pretty amazing see Alfred Nobel realized and he actually um, uh, put this on a plaque that's associated with him and it says every person should have an opportunity to change their legacy midstream. Brothers and sisters, we have that opportunity. We can take our busyness and fuel it with real purpose. We can take our testimony 
and we can use it to reach people that maybe nobody else could. Your story is important to somebody and they need to hear what Jesus Christ has done in your life. It's our obligation. It's our privilege. I'd like to take the scripture that Craig read for us earlier and I'd like to just change it just a little bit because we've been given a real gift to call ourselves Christ followers. It is from 1 Timothy, and it's from the first chapter, and it's verses 12 through 14. But change the pronoun. We thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who gave us strength, that he considered us trustworthy, appointing us to his service, even though I once was fill in the blank. The grace of our Lord was poured out on us abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Friends, this is great news. Amen. Amen. As you remain standing, I invite you to join in the words of the Apostles' Creed, words that have been handed down to us for such a time as this, that we might boldly and strongly proclaim to the world what it is that we believe as Christ followers. So I ask you, Christ followers, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're being seated, I invite you to a moment of prayer as we come. There are many prayer requests that are here. As you can see, there's a long list in our bulletin. I trust that to your prayers, that you might include them before God. There are some that I would like just to update you on. We are giving thanks for some of the blessings God has um, given us, and we acknowledge, you can see the flowers are 
on a, given in honor of a new grandson to the Johnsons. We are pleased that our brother Woody Carver is recuperating from hip surgery and uh, will soon be leaving Encompass to the great disappointment of all the nurses that he's wooed over there. Uh, yeah, it's a, quite a story. Uh, <laughs> you got to know Woody and love Woody. Uh, uh, he does appreciate all of your visits, particularly from um, those who have come almost every day, including Bertha and Phil Bright, and um, he really appreciates that as he recovers. There's others that um, are healing from different surgeries and having different tests. You can see them listed in your bulletin and need our prayers. We got a, another prayer request from Susan that a friend, Pat, has found that received the news that her oldest child, who's only 55, has an inoperable brain tumor and so needs prayers and um, that our darkest days are not our last days, that God alone gets to write the final chapter of our lives. And with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, it is Pete at the wall praying. Lord, not because you don't already know each and every one of these situations in far greater detail than we do. But we take these time, these moments, because you asked us to attune our hearts beyond our little self to matters greater, to other people, to be connected with others whom you love. Lord, you ask us to tune our hearts to the things that hurt your heart so we raise all these situations and different people and trials and tribulations to your care we do so with an assurance and a confidence that you can overcome each and every situation in your will and by your power and way ways that we might not understand or sometimes we may even think you are absent but you are still there in your way so give us the confidence that your will is being done. Lord, we know that there is much work that we have to do. We know that you have claimed and named each one of us. We're beloved children. And you ask us simply to follow you and trust you and to align our footsteps with your purpose in the midst of our busyness to focus on your kingdom building here to allow us to know as Portia has said that you gave us a past so that we would have a future to give to someone else and that you will use anyone most likely even those that we least suspect and that means us to do your will so that when it's done people will say it couldn't have been them it had to be God working through them Lord, we offer ourselves and all these prayers to you in that tone, in that tenor. But Lord, we need your prayers, your power on us. So in these moments now, fill us with your spirit and hear our petitions silently to you. Gracious God, when Jesus walked the earth and his followers walked along with him, they, they saw him pray. They already knew how to pray. They had been taught for centuries before how to pray. But when they saw Jesus pray, they saw something different. They observed a relationship. They saw more than just words or wrote. They saw communication happen. And so they asked Jesus to teach them how to pray in that way. And Jesus taught them. So now hear your children as we stand and share the prayer that the Savior taught us.
You may be seated, and as you're being seated, the ushers are coming forward at this time that we might give joyfully and abundantly. Some of you have already given. You give on a monthly basis. Some of you give electronically, and some of you are acknowledging that by putting in a wooden cross. So I encourage you all not to judge your neighbor by what goes in or doesn't go into the plate. Know that God knows, and God loves a joyful giver. So give joyfully and abundantly this day. giver of all gifts, we thank you for the many blessings that you pour into our lives. We now offer back to you these tokens, these financial gifts, the gifts, the first part of what you first gave us. But with them, we offer not only these gifts, but all the things that you have given us, even the things that are in our past that are now part of our ability to give a future, our busyness, our willingness to focus now on a purpose and the opportunity, the obligation, the blessing to be part of building your kingdom. May you all find it to your praise and to your glory. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
brothers and sisters, our time of worship has come to an end, but the time for us to write the legacy that we'll leave has just begun. So go out, leave this place, and tell your story and change the world. Amen.